This lecture is on Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky. His dates, 1840 to 1893. He was a Russian conductor who also conducted in Europe and the United States. He was a composer, he was an educator. He wrote, as a composer, he wrote symphonies, operas, ballets, concert overtures. We're gonna look at a couple of the examples of his works as well. But before we get to that, let's just talk about Peter Tchaikovsky as a, as, as a person. Initially, he was a government clerk. Um, and then at the age of 21, he entered the St. Petersburg Conservatory. And you have to remember the conservatories um, uh, at this point in time were actually created in Russia. Um, the Moscow Conservatory was created in 1866 and the St. Petersburg Conservatory was created in 1862. Um, in fact, we know that Rimsky Korsakov uh, taught at the conservatory um, during this time. So um, he was, the Rimsky Korsakov was teaching at St. Petersburg. Ultimately, after um, Tchaikovsky goes to the St. Petersburg Conservatory, he ends up in, uh, as a professor at the Moscow Conservatory. Um, a couple things about him personally, just so you have an idea of his life. Um, he had two very important women in his life. The first one, of course, he married his conservatory student who was nine years his junior. Um, and that was because she said that if, if he didn't marry her, she was gonna throw his, uh, she was gonna kill herself. So it ends up that Tchaikovsky gets to the point where after he marries her, he decides he, maybe he has needs to throw himself into the Moscow River. So that does not work out. But the other person that's important to his musical career is Nadja Van Meck. And that is um, the, the person who for 13 years was his patroness. The stipulation was is that they would never meet. They would only um, talk through letters. And she commissioned a lot of works um, through those 13 years. She paid him a fixed annuity so he didn't even have to worry about um, needing to live off of um, anything else besides his music. And, but they never, and they agreed that they would never meet. A very interesting relationship. Another thing I wanted to make mention of is that Tchaikovsky uh, suffered uh, bouts of depression, uh, very much like when we talked about Schumann and Berlioz and um, Franz Liszt at times and even Beethoven. Uh, how do we know about how he, what he was thinking about? There are diaries that we have of his that begin at the age of 33 and end at age 51. He dies at the age of 53. He also wrote a lot of letters to his family, um, especially to his brother Modeste. Um, when we're uh, talking about his um, final moments on this earth, a lot of times there's always that question of how did Tchaikovsky die? Supposedly he died of cholera, meaning that he drank untreated water. But there is always that question mark, just like in some of the other stories that we talked about, like Mozart and what have you, that is that really the way that he died? And the reason for this is, is because uh, Tchaikovsky was a homosexual. And in Russia at this time, if you were found out, the punishment was loss of civil rights, public disgrace and exile to Siberia. Uh, we know for a fact that Tchaikovsky got involved with an 18 year old nephew of the Count who was close to the Tsar. And of course it didn't um, pan out and there were ill feelings and the Count writes a letter to the Tsar condemning Tchaikovsky as a homosexual. And at that point, supposedly Tchaikovsky is put in front of a kangaroo court and there are questions as to if this is true or not, but the kangaroo court's decision was that the only way out was that Tchaikovsky would kill himself, and maybe that's the reason why he drank the untreated water. 
almost like a poison to um, kill himself at the end. But uh, when you look at a lot of the biographical sources, they always just say he died of cholera. The other thing uh, that I wanted to talk about was the fact that um, his feelings about the Russian Five. And this is important because the Russian Five were happening at the same time uh, that with Mussorgsky and Rinsky Korsakov and all of those, the, the, the guys that we spoke about before. Um, but we noticed that they were very much into this Russian nationalism, whereas Tchaikovsky was always known as a cosmopolitan. I mean, a cosmopolitan, uh, a person that was more of a cosmopolitan composer. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, that means basically he was much more interested in what was happening in Europe. Um, and so, therefore, a lot of times he looked at form more so as a universal form that was used or stories that were used that were not necessarily Russian. But he plays two ends of the coin, because we're going to see in the 1812 um, overture, he's going to use tunes that are um, very nationalistic. Um, so, but the way he looked at the Russian Five is very interesting. And he says, all the newest Petersburg composers are very gifted persons, but they are all afflicted to the marrow with the worst sort of conceit and with a purely dilettantish confidence in their superiority over all the rest of the musical world. Rimsky Korsakov has been the recent exception. He too was self-taught like the others, but a radical change has occurred in him. Rimsky had recently been appointed uh, the professor of uh, composition at the St. Petersburg Conservatory. As a very young man, he uh, fell in with a group of people who first assured him he was a genius, then told him it was not necessary to study that schooling kills inspiration, dries up creativity, and so on. At first, he believed this. His first compositions reveal a very great talent devoid of any theoretical training. In the circle to which he belonged, everyone was in love with himself and with one another. Kui is a, dil a gifted dilettante. His music is devoid of originality, but is elegant and graceful. Baradin is a 50-year-old professor of chemistry at the Academy of Medicine. Again, a talent, even an impressive one. He has less taste than Kui, and his technique is so weak that he cannot write a line without outside help. Mazursky, you very call, correctly call a has-been. In talent, he perhaps exceeds all the others, but he has a narrow stature and lacks the need for self-perfection. The most outstanding person of this circle is Belakarev, but he has grown silent after accomplishing very little. He has immense gifts and they are lost because of some fateful circumstances that have made a saintly prig of him. This then is my honest opinion of these gentlemen. What a sad thing. With the exception of Rimsky Korsakov, how many talents from whom it is futile to await anything serious? And is this not generally the way in Russia? Tremendous powers fatally hindered by a sort of plevna from taking the field and enjoying, enjoining battle as they should. Nevertheless, these powers exist. Even a Mussorgsky, his very lack of discipline, speaks a new language. It is ugly, but it is fresh. So you can see what he thought about the Russian Five, the only one that kind of gets out of that um, circumstance of how he felt about them was Rimsky Korsakov because he ends up being at the conservatory. Uh, the other thing, um, that I wanted to, to talk about was the fact that um, Tchaikovsky, he wrote in many different genres, and we're not gonna be able to um, address all the genres, but there are two genres I'd like to address. One of them is the, um, the ballet, when we're gonna look at Swan Lake, and the other is the concert overture, and we're gonna look at two there. We're gonna look at the uh, Romeo and Juliet concert overture, and we're going to look at the 1812 overture, because one's more cosmopolitan and the other one's more nationalistic. So, we're gonna start with the ballet, but it's very important that you understand that when we're talking about a, a ballet, it's a different kind of form that um, we haven't experienced yet in the class, and that is that if you had to give it a definition, a ballet is a series of solo and concerted dances, like a core, with mimetic 
actions accompanied by music and scenic accessories, all expressive of a dramatic story provided by an author or a choreographer. So you still have a libretto, you still have the orchestral music, but you're gonna notice that there's going to be no singing, per se. Um, the one thing that we also notice is, is that for the characters, especially since they are kind of being presented um, with gestures and what have you, and costumes and what have you, that we have the use of the light motifs, meaning that a light motif is very similar to that E. Day Feeks we talked about with um, Berlioz, and we're giving like a tune to the characters as we actually um, see them perform the ballet. So in Swan Lake, Swan Lake was the very first ballet um, that uh, Tchaikovsky created. What's interesting about the Swan Lake is, is that um, we think that it was possibly from a Russian folktale, the White Duck. And we also know that Tchaikovsky had created a little ballet for his niece and nephew called the Lake of the Swans at their home in 1871, which was kind of a precursor to this um, beautiful Swan Lake. Um, when you're listening to Swan Lake, the one thing you're going to notice is, is there's the very beautiful swan theme. So every time that you have the, uh, the, uh, the swan, um, you're going to hear that too. Uh, the choreographer, the one who created the dances, was Julius Reisinger who was engaged at that time at the Bolshoi. And it was, it's interesting how the developmental process of how they created these um, ballets, because initially Tchaikovsky only knew about the dances that were preferred for the ballet, but um, Reisinger began the choreography after the score was totally complete. And that's when Reisinger decides that, well, maybe I want some changes. So it really wasn't a collaboration of composer and choreographer. The other thing that we notice is, is that uh, Reisinger even set some numbers um, composed by uh, Tchaikovsky aside. He said that music was not suitable for ballet. In fact, he even began choreographing dances to other composers' music. And that's when Tchaikovsky protests and his pieces are reinstated into the Swan Lake. Um, the uh, Moscow premiere of this in 1877 with Reisinger as the choreographer, Tchaikovsky as the composer, was a disaster. And there are a lot of reasons why maybe Reisinger really didn't understand Tchaikovsky's music, but we also think it's because the prima ballerina that was supposed to be the one that was going to take the main uh, character of Odette, um, she has a complaint against her from uh, one of the officials of, of in, in Moscow because he had given her all of this jewelry and he had professed love for her and what does he, she do? She turns around and uh, she um, decides to go with a ballet dancer and she sells the jewelry that he had given her. So that makes it so that the, gov the official says she cannot um, perform the part. So you didn't have the main prima ballerina performing in the very first performance. Like I said, it's probably also because Reisinger really didn't understand Tchaikovsky's music. And the good news was is that it ultimately would be re-choreographed by the St. Petersburg Ballet, uh, Marius Petipa, um, as the choreographer who did the choreography for Sleeping Beauty and Nutcracker of Tchaikovsky. Unfortunately, it was done um, in 19, uh, 1895, and of course, as you can look at the uh, dates of Tchaikovsky, that is two years after the death of Tchaikovsky, so he never really saw that version. So if you're going to be uh, looking at this, and I am asking you to look at uh, the final scene, I would suggest very much that you look at the American Ballet performance. Um, it, because one of the dancers, of course, is Angel Corella, who is also the um, artistic director of the Pennsylvania Ballet. And I think you'll enjoy this performance. I'm asking you just to look at, on the YouTube, the final scene of the Swan Lake.
but so that you understand the story. It's very interesting. It, it's it's a, a story in four acts, and Prince Siegfried is going to be celebrating um, his 21st birthday. His parents want him to get married. Um, but before um, this, this the, the very famous ball, he goes out with his friends and he goes hunting and he sees this swan and he goes to shoot the swan and what does he realize? But she turns into a beautiful woman. Her name is Odette. She is under the spell of an evil sorcerer, Rothbart. It can only be broken if someone professes true love. Now, of course, he is smitten by her and, um, of course, realizes that this is the situation. In the, the, fun, the next act, we notice that there's the ball. The ball is where his mother really wants him to find somebody, and who do you think shows up at the ball? Not Odette, even though it looks like Odette, but Rothbart, who is the evil magician, he brings his daughter, but he is able to create her to look like um, Odette, and her name is Odile. And the way that you know that it is Odette or Odile is, is because the ballerina wears the white tutu for Odette and the black tutu for Odile, the daughter of Rothbard. Well, when he sees her, he thinks that it's the same person that he saw when he was um, in the forest, and he professes love for Odile not for Odette. And at that point, Odette is lost forever, meaning that th there's no way that she's gonna be able to um, become his beloved. He runs back to ask for her forgiveness. The only thing is that he can do at that point with, of course, Odette is they have to both die because that's the only way to break the spell. And of course, with that, with Rothbart, the evil sorcerer, is vanquished. And so in that very last scene, they supposedly throw themselves into the lake and they die. So when you're um, watching this, I want you to see the, um, this in this final scene, you will see Odette because of course, that he's coming back, Prince Sigrid's coming back to say his sorry and hoping that maybe he can change the situation, but it can only be changed through death. For those who love movies, this was the inspiration for the famous movie, The Black Swan. The other work that um, I want you to um, listen to is the concert overture of Romeo and Juliet based on the Shakespearean storyline of the, the Romeo and Juliet who are from two families. And of course, because the two families can't get along, they don't want them to marry, um, um, even though they're secretly married by the very famous um, Friar Lawrence. So in this concert overture, the concert overture is an orchestral piece. It's one movement. It's programmatic, but different than a symphonic poem, it is in sonata allegro form, meaning that there are themes that will be exposed, developed, and at the end there'll be a recapitulation. What's interesting about it also diff um, is that it's a concert overture is different than an operatic overture because nothing follows it. It's just one movement. So in the Romeo and Juliet, when you're listening to it, you open with the Friar Lawrence theme, which is you'll have the, that's the introductory theme, and then you have theme one, which is going to be the Montagues and Capulets kind of fighting, and you'll hear this dialogue between them. Okay, and then the Romeo and Juliet theme, which is the very famous theme
So, and in that theme, when you're listening to it, there's a part in there where you can actually hear like the heartbeat. So that is the um, Romeo and Juliet Overture. The other overture that I want you to listen to, because it is more nationalistic, whereas the Romeo and Juliet is more what you'd think and more cosmopolitan because of the nature of the uh, theme that is used of the Romeo and Juliet story. But in the 1812 overture, um, I'd just like you to um, uh, take a listen to this as well. This is a very um, interesting work because it uses two themes. The, that are actually very nationalistic for Russia. The first theme, of course, is the, oh God, save the people. And you're gonna notice when you are listening to this, uh, you will hear, actually, it's a Russian Orthodox hymn. Other is the God Save the Tsar. Okay. But along with those two themes, you're also going to hear the Marseillaise, the French national anthem. And in this, of course, the very famous canons. So I would suggest that you look at the YouTube version of this because that is a very interesting version that has the canons. It's the Leningrad um, Orchestra doing it. And I think you'll enjoy that performance uh, visually, or you can just listen to it um, either on YouTube as um, just an audio. But I think it's very interesting to see the um, performance of that for the um, 1812 overture. So the two overtures that I want you to, um, to listen to are the Romeo and Juliet con concert overture as well as the 1812 concert overture. Um, another thing about the Romeo and Juliet overture, are some people always say, oh, is that another ballet? No, it is not a ballet. It's just a concert overture. There are other people that use the Romeo and Juliet as a theme for their ballets. Um, and then I want you to um, look at the YouTube version of the Swan Lake, the final act. 